The fourth realignment, the fourth shift in the standards has to do with writing. What are the most popular forms of writing today in the American high school, including in New York State? What? <laughs> That's sadly true, yes, indeed. Let's not get into technology. Um, what are the official forms of writing that are accepted for, that are accepted for graded product in our schools? I'm, I'm looking for two answers. I know it's early, but if you don't answer, I'm going to call on you. <laughs> essays. Essays of pers personal, you got one, right? Personal essays, personal narratives, or? That's exactly right. You've got both. One is a personal essay explaining a narrative experience. The second is a persuasive essay sharing an opinion. The only problem with these two forms of writing is they don't get you very far in college and career readiness. Otherwise, they're terrific. <laughs> that is, it is rare at a job that the boss says, Johnson, I want a market analysis, but before that, I want a compelling narrative about your childhood. <laughs> it's equally rare in the college environment that that happens. Yet we demand it of kids consistently as a dominant force of writing in K-12. That's very strange. Secondly, the persuasion about an opinion you hold, you know, kind of I think this essay. Well, when you grow up in the world, you soon learn who cares what you think, actually. <laughs> I'm much more interested in whether you have any evidence to support an argument or a claim. So what the standards do is they refocus persuasion on argument and supporting that argument with evidence. And secondly, writing to inform or explain or share complex information with someone else in a vivid way. These two forms, as you see on the chart on the other side of the fifth of page five, align with NAEP again. And you see that we renamed to persuade to argue. So there we differed from Nate to make the expectation much clearer. But then argument and explaining take up 80% of the focus in later grades. Even though narrative is developed throughout as the important substructure of those, the final demand is that kids can argue and inform. So you see what we're after here, which is not subtle, small details, but major shifts to break the wall the eighth grade limit I was talking about. I'm just going to show you a couple of more details about the English language arts standards and then move to mathematics. I want to turn with you to the start to actually get into them, which is on page 10, which is the College and Career Readiness Standards for Reading. There are 10 Career and College Readiness standards for reading. 10 and only 10. If you want to change instruction and help teachers and students, focus is simply everything. It is the hardest thing in a standards environment. When we got comments, people would say, we love the focus, but could you just add this? In standards meetings, the way to shut up the most annoying person in the room is to add their thing. And then all kids must do it. Right? It's a kind of fun game that way, because the difference between standards writers and teachers and principals is standards writers don't care about time. It's short to write the standard. It barely breaks a sweat to add a requirement. But it forces hours of time and practice if we're serious with kids. So if we want a generation to achieve at higher levels, taking the time of instruction and practice on the part of students seriously is at the heart of it. Otherwise, it's a fantasy that we're going to get to a higher level. So these 10, if they might they, that you might imagine them as a sort of catechism that you're working on in K-12 as you build towards your readiness for college and career. The first one is to read closely, to determine what the text says explicitly, and to make logical inferences from it. Cite specific textual evidence when writing or speaking to support conclusions drawn from the text. This seems rather vanilla as a demand. You'll notice the first part says, read closely to determine what it says explicitly. That is, please be able to tell me exactly what this says and does not say. This may surprise you. This is not clear in virtually any set of state standards I've seen. And the result is we have a culture in English language arts. We examine this in two states. Interestingly, just because of who's in the audience, Texas and Vermont. And we informally monitored instruction in two of those states. And we found the following result. 80% of the questions students are asked when they're reading are not text dependent. They refer to other things outside the text. So in a joking way, if I, ask, if I were talking about Hamlet, and I say, does this remind you about your mother and the tensions you had with her? <laughs> that
that's quite a fun question, and the kids might seem very engaged to discuss that, but that doesn't mean they have to deal with the difficulties of the language or the play. So many ways to escape the difficulties of reading when we ask kids how it's relevant to them, what it connects to, what else it does, how it has to do with another conversation. So little time is spent on the explicit understanding of what the text says and does not say. And the first standard refocuses entirely on making that the first and master art. What does it say? What does it not say? Cite specific textual evidence when writing or speaking to support the conclusions you draw from it. Make your evidence public. To see how these standards operate, I'd like to focus on that first standard and look at how it develops. So if you turn the page, you'll notice that there are, that there's a striking coincidence, which is that in kindergarten through fifth grade, um, page 11 are the reading standards for literature in K-5, and you'll notice that there are again 10 standards in each grade. In kindergarten, in grade one, in grade two, and then if you turn the page, in grade three, grade four, and grade five. This is not because of a strange biblical fetish on the part of the standards writers. There are some conspiracy theorists who think so. Um, instead, as you've probably already draft, as you probably already have drawn, the 10 standards in each grade correspond to the 10 college and career ready standards. That is, you're deliberately building in K-12 a staircase towards exactly what you need to be able to do so that you have the time and energy to practice it over the years. So what does that mean? If you get back to our eighth grade NAEP scores, what we learned from looking at the, the assessment data very closely is what separated the women from the girls or men from the boys or those who could break that wall from those who could not was one master capacity above all, their ability to assemble evidence for their understanding of the text. So that's what diminishes. That's what they can't do. You ask them why they have a certain answer and they can't do it as they get back to that more complex text. So if you wanted every student to be able to do that very well, what would you have to do? Well, in grade five, if you look with me at standard one, by grade five, students have to quote accurately from a text when explaining what the text says explicitly and when drawing inferences from it. Does everyone see that? Standard one in literature on page 12. Now let's look at that, what that same standard means in later grades. So if you'll turn to me now to page 37, excuse me, 36. You'll see this same standard developing. So by grade seven, we demand not only that you can quote accurately from a text, but in grade seven that you can cite several pieces of textual evidence to support analysis of what the text says. In grade eight, we make a fundamental advance. You can cite the textual evidence that most strongly supports your claims or analysis about the text. Right, so, so it's not enough to say use text evidence, which is what standards sometimes say when they're being careful. But is it the best evidence? Is it the strongest evidence? Is it all the evidence that's there? So by 11th and 12th grade, when we're getting ready for college and career, you'll see on page 38, standard one in 11th to 12th grade, cite strong and thorough textual evidence to support analysis of what the text says explicitly, including determining where the text leaves matters uncertain. So understanding evidence in its absence and understanding uncertainty. To demand that of someone without this rigorous growth over the years would be crazy. But as one expectation of 10 built over 10 years, it becomes a serious expectation. That's how the standards are bent to work and build a staircase. And I could walk through each one with you. But I hope that interests you enough that you could see and that if you were then a fourth grade teacher looking above and below, you could actually kind of get a sense relatively quickly of where you're moving kids along these lines. And I will tell you, one of my funnest moments, funnest, I mean, uh, one of the best moments in doing this was a teacher from California who had been practicing with these. And she said, I've got this Native American kid in my third grade class, and they are the best at referring to evidence within the text. I thought, this is a good sign. So that's how the standards operate. They operate that way in reading and in writing and in speaking and listening. They'll notice that exactly as they operate, there are those 10 anchoring standards that are built throughout, that are then applied to literature and then applied to informational text. Someone, you know, it's strange criticisms you get. Someone was angry that the first standard doesn't change when reading literature or informational text because they thought that we should change them. Less students practice something very well when they're reading two types of text. They are precisely the same. One big move these standards make is to make the reading of literature, the very high level reading of literature, much more like 
reading a difficult scientific text or reading a difficult history text. That is the primary question when you're reading Shakespeare is not what it reminds you of, or what you think about it, but what's happening here? Exactly what did happen and not happen? What caused what to happen? What might happen next? These are the questions of science and history as much as they are the questions of reading Shakespeare with care. If you look at the end of the document, and then I'll move on to math, you'll see a very important part and interesting for this room. The standards for literacy in history and science. And you'll notice something funny on page 60. So if you look at page 59, that's the title then. The stand these are now the standards for literacy in history slash social studies, science, and technical subjects. So these are extending these literacy standards, not just to the English language arts teacher in 612, but deliberately to the history and science teachers. And you'll notice if you look at page 60 that we are quite lazy that the anchor standards for reading remain precisely the same for college and career readiness. Now, this is an idea about making curriculum and professional development a whole lot cheaper, right? In other words, if you have that elegance where you can have a serious discussion from practitioner to practitioner about a core set of fundamental capacities, we think it's a much more powerful way to drive it forward. So I show you all these details because design is everything here. In other words, there's no such thing as common standards being better than state standards at that level of detail. The only way I can design something that really helps you do your work, David, is if we pay attention to that level of detail and build you something that functions in this way. And that's what, the new st that's what these core standards are about, and they're meant to build a staircase for many more kids to achieve college and career readiness without remediation. That is their aim. That is their purpose. And the way we did this work was to build on the best of existing state standards. We did not, that would have been much easier. You know, you could have gotten to what common standards were by looking at what all 50 states did and then draw a circle around the common stuff. That would have been nice. Um, and certainly mediocre. Uh, we instead consulted the evidence as to what mattered most for career and college readiness, then looked at the best of state standards, including, of course, New York State, which we looked at with great care. 